Um, well, I'm very pleased to say that I agree with everything Ron said as well. Um, <laughs> I'm very inspired by um, John setting the scene particularly. And I think what I'm going to talk about now really is how we put it into practice. And perhaps push a bit further this idea that the key to protecting the future of this great collection is actually in having churches more open and more connected to the community. That is the only way forward. I think we're very clear we are talking about a great national collection, which is on a par, at the very least, with those of the best museums and galleries, and yet with a fraction of the prestige or the resources. I think that picture's been shown very clearly. And I think we're also seeing as national funding comes under pressure more and more, and churches face unprecedented challenges of all different types, um, there is a big issue about how we do secure the future of such a huge number of buildings and contents. And I'm pretty clear, sadly, that the answer will not come in the form of a great top-down government or church building grant or initiative. Um, the answer has to be bottom-up. It has to be about the <coughs> unique relationship with communities that these buildings and contents have. And it has to be about partnerships, about working together, really, as John was saying, bringing in the wider community, um, people not necessarily churchgoers, who will join us in caring for these buildings and their contents. And will bring money, time, and mutual support. And so to get there, we have to maximise public access, we have to increase use, increase visitors, increase public awareness and support, and also increase eyes and ears protection. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about how we're doing that at the Church's Conservation Trust. Um, most of you probably know who we are, but very quick. Um, remind that we are a small charity with a very large heritage collection. Um, we own 345 historic English parish churches and their contents, all of them Anglican churches, all of them still consecrated but no longer within the parochial system, um, all with very high architectural, archaeological or historic merit. We're a charity, an interesting charity, because we were established by Parliament using ecclesiastical legislation. So we have a very strong relationship with the Church and Parliament, but um, we are subject to charity law. Um, we receive funding from the Department of Culture, Media and Sport and from the Church Commissioners. Um, the government grants have been dropping steeply, 7-10% to 10 a year in recent years, and frozen for many years. The Church grant has been frozen for a decade or so, but at least is sustaining. Um, and so, uh, like any charity, we are seeking voluntary support a lot more work on fundraising. We're asking people to join us as members. We're looking for donations from visitors and supporters, and we are um, working very hard to get support from trust foundations and the Heritage Lottery Fund. All the keys to the future. Um, our turnover is six million a year, which is um, not very much for 345 historic sites. We have 50 staff across um, England, and absolutely core to our ability to do what we do, and hopefully do more our volunteers. We have about 2,000 regular volunteers. So we're looking after I did do that. We're looking after buildings that define the English landscape. Okay? It's got a mind its own. Um, this is St. Margaret and Hales in, in Norfolk, the exterior of the church, as John pointed out again, is, is as important, unchanged since the 12th century. And then these amazing interiors, a great jumble of history. That is West Burkholz in Essex, and the next one is Wolfencote on the Warwickshire border. Um, 14th century Saxon remains, 18th and 19th century woodwork, Jacobean royal arms. Th these, these, are, these are buildings the public love without knowing anything about them. They walk in and they go, wow, I had no idea. Um, it's automatic. Um, and then we've got these complete contrasts in the way the all in a one Victorian buildings and interiors. This is Skelton from Newby in, um, in North Yorkshire. Amazing collection of sculpture, glasswork, metalwork, textiles, tile work. Actually, interestingly, these are harder for the general public to appreciate and understand um, and uh, need a lot more explanation, but equally important to protect and save. Um, furnishings, John illustrated again what we mean. Church treasures is a very, very broad term, um, and we include ceilings. These are angels in the ceiling at Stanford St. John in Lincolnshire, and furnishings. Um, in the same church, this is the pew end. Uh, the most amazing collection of contents I can only touch on uh, 
um, be careful. This is a Masonic influenced lectern in the recently saved Valley of St. Edmund in the very poor um, city of Rochdale in uh, Lancashire. Um, very proud that we have saved this amazing historian building recently. And textiles. Uh, many of our churches contain fine examples of design and craftsmanship. This is the altar front called the Skelton Community, which I showed you earlier, the Victorian church. Um, now, this was recently conserved um, with great care and attention, and we agonised about whether to put it back in the church, um, because the church is open, it is unmanned, um, it is in the grounds of Newby Hall, so it's a fairly protected area, um, but the public can walk in, and there were those who said it needs to be in a glass case in the main house, and we felt very strongly that it needed to be in the situ, its original location. What you're doing here, and what churches are doing all the time, is balancing the risk, because of course there is a risk, somebody will come and vandalise or steal it, um, against what I see as a loss of value of taking it out of its original location. So I think you actually sometimes destroy value um, by removing an artefact and putting it in a glass case or museumifying it, as Lord said earlier. Um, we're talking about um, pulpits, this is the Bodley Pulpit, Cambridge All Saints. Again, um, this is being lovingly um, conserved. Protecting craft skills is a very important part of this conversation about protecting church treasures. If we don't keep the craft skills alive, um, who will preserve these things in the future? And we have loads of glasswork. We're pleased to hear, John, um, loads of painted glass. Um, this is our, uh, these are our 16, uh, 16 St. Bernard stained glass panels in St. Mary Shrewsbury. Um, medieval glass from Holtenberg Abbey near Cologne, brought over by a Victorian vicar. Um, they were actually taken out and exhibited in an international exhibition in Cologne in 2007. Now that was controversial because many people said, oh, you shouldn't move them, um, you're putting them at risk. But actually, again, public awareness, um, sharing these things, making people understand and care for them is absolutely key. key. And of course, the exhibitors uh, were very careful with them and, and returned them totally intact and conserved. So we've pleased about that. Um, Stratford Tony St. Michael and All Angels in Wiltshire. This medieval church is reached down a narrow lane over a footpath across a stream and up a sheep bank, a steep bank, <laughs> making the journey <coughs> a part of the adventure. And that, for me, again, is a crucial part of the treasures you find in churches. Um, you, you, you look in the most tiny little places hidden in the wood and you come across these amazing works of art. Um, this one was recently recently restored, that's a before and after, um, just to show some of the work we do. Back to Cambridge All Saints, the Morris Church, this is the east window, a pre-Raphaelite tour de force, mm -hmm. made in 1866, a memorial to Lady Affleck, who founded um, the church. Twenty figures, each individually designed by Edward Burne Jones, Ford Mannix Brown and William Morris. Uh, by contrast, over in Princetown, in the middle of Dartmoor, we've recently um, managed to we actually remove these windows and conserve it, and we just put it back. That was funded entirely by donations, including from the uh, Daughters of uh, the Revolution of 1810 in America, who came over especially. Um, it was, uh, the, built, the church was built by American prisoners of war from Princetown Prison. And just to show that church treasures and new use are not in conflict, complement each other. This is a fairly ordinary Victorian glass window in our wonderful Grade 1 Georgian Church of St. Paul's Bristol, um, which is now a circuit school and performance space that's beautifully conserved, still consecrated, um, centuries remains, and a wonderful community building. So location is everything. Uh, John also mentioned monuments. CCT has the most amazing range of monuments. Alabaster tombs of Hare with All Saints in Yorkshire. Here's the dog at their feet. Um, some of the finest sculpture in the most humble rural churches, and that is uh, the, uh, the East Shepherd in Berkshire. An idyllic spot beside a water meadow next to the river at Lambourne. You go in there, you turn the corner, and there's these amazing monuments. And likewise, wall paintings. Um, that, is, that, that is art, still in its original location. Often hidden for, for years. This is Malton St. Mary in Norfolk, also a very tiny rural spot, um, open to the public every day. You walk in, you can almost discover these for yourself. There's no glass case, there's no rope, there's no curator. Um, you are almost the person finding them for the first time. 
Um, English and St. John the Baptist, some of our most important wall paintings in one of our favourite churches in Wiltshire, the Morris favourite. 13th to 19th century, covering the walls, often with one painted over another, sometimes seven layers thick. And we've been doing conservation with volunteers and students from the German University for, for years and years and years. Um, fascinating. And of course, Victorian wall paintings as well, but it's back to All Saints, one of our favourites. We recently completed a project to photograph all wall paintings in our churches. We want to um, show our uh, collection as something you can explore, discover, and see together. There are 80 churches that are now all online. Um, you can look on our website, which spans the entire breadth of styles and ages since the first paint stroke from the 12th to the 19th century. And in fact, we even have some 21st century. Um, you would call it graffiti, but some people call it wall painting um, in Bristol as well. Times are hard, money is dwindling, there are issues with congregations in some areas, state support is receding, economic development sometimes threatens buildings or changes in worship buildings. <coughs> so everywhere there's an issue of how we're we going to protect these treasures in the future. If buildings are neglected or closed, sold for different uses, contents are at risk. And even when a church is cared for and in use like CCT Church at Tor Bryan down in Devon, still there are risks. And we saw the, the theft. We haven't talked about theft today, we talked all about sale. Theft, of course, is the other risk with value um, of two of our wonderful panels from the 15th century medieval screen there, which you will have seen in the press, called the imagination of the press in the summer. Um, what do you do about this? This, this church is open to the public every day, all the volunteers. Um, somebody just came and smashed them out. Um, how do you protect these buildings without locking them up and putting them even more at risk by making them abandoned? Sometimes a technical fix is inevitable, um, and in Torbriar we have reluctantly installed an alarm. Um, but it's expensive, it requires maintenance and monitoring, and it's not perfect. And this alarm keeps getting set off, and the locals are now saying, can you turn it off? So technical fixes, to me, are often a last resort. And everyone says, why can't you have CCTV? Well, I think more important and more effective our eyes and ears. Legitimate visitors and volunteers and supporters and users of the church are the best protection a church can have. We saw an example of that this week um, in our church in Sunderland, Grade 1 Georgian Church, Holy Trinity there. Um, some local guys decided they were going to remove the Georgian railings with bolt cutters um, because they could melt them down or something. I don't know what they thought they were going to do with them. And the guy from the youth centre next door saw them and came out said, oh, what are you doing? And they said, oh, well, this church is empty, isn't it? It's redundant. So, again, this proves to me that if the church looks closed or is not being used, is more at risk. So use is the key. Um, in fact, the guy from the youth centre recognised these guys because they were ex mates of his from years back. They used to be in the same business. He's now running a youth centre. And uh, once he explained to them that it was a CCD church, and actually there's a project to bring him into use, and they said, it's all right, we'll, we'll keep out of this from now on. So... Eyes and ears, absolutely key. CCTV there would have possibly put a grainy photo of them too late. What's the point? Eyes and ears. That means volunteering, it means young people, it means involving communities, it means extended use. It doesn't mean new use is replacing the traditional use, but it means use is in conversation, in sympathy with the historic use. Even with a circuit school, you can still have a consecrated sanctuary. Involving local people, local management, and involving other organisations and partners. Here's one example in Skibbles in Lincolnshire, frequently vandalised church. Now we have a nature reserve and a, an education programme, um, and that's reduced vandalism. This is an issue across Europe. Um, there was a conference last November in Utrecht, which I went to, um, on movable religious heritage. A big debate, but the same agreement we're seeing today, that it's very important to keep working in situ soft protection wherever possible is the best, but extended sympathetic use, bringing life into churches is key. And there's an even much greater public awareness and financial support. What we're doing about that at CCT is launching our History for the Future Fund. We're all going to leave on this. This is to help us protect CCT churches in the long term. Contents which are perhaps struggles getting money to save them. Um, we've set up an endowment fund Heritage Lottery Fund are matching it pound for pound, and with gift aid, that makes your donation worth even more. So please consider helping us with this. Um, this money in the long term will protect things like 
12th century door and the little hall meeting in St. Mary in Hertfordshire, the world famous Jesse window at Shrewsbury, a 14th century tiles at All Saints in Suffolk in Hickingham, the amazing memorials to the Curzon family at All Saints in Kenilston, rich with textiles in the Curzon Chapel, banners, altar hangings, silk embroidered hangings, all these things need funding to help us conserve and to train volunteers to care for them and keep an eye on them in the future. Um, and even the 19th century vestry in St. James Cooling, which is lined with thousands of cockle, cockle shells. Um, this church was the inspiration for Dickens' great expectations. So please uh, consider signing up for this. A small regular donation will add up to a lot more in the long term, um, particularly with HLF funding. So you can see the sheer variety of art and artefacts inside historic parish churches is second to none. Parish churches are the galleries of the nation and match the standard of any national museum. But they are not museums. They are living community buildings still in use for their original purpose while increasingly providing for wider community, tourism, cultural and sometimes even business needs. This provides for a unique challenge, lots of risks and threats, but also a unique opportunity. And we must not see open access and community use as a threat to the contents of churches and cast their, con cut their, cut their contents off to another place, but as an integral part of the solution. And done well, and properly consulting, I totally endorse John's comments about how bunging in heating and taking fuse out without knowing why you're doing it does not work. You have to really develop use through consultation and local involvement. But if you get it right, you can do something really well protect the future of the church and its historic contents for generations to come. And that's what we're trying to do in City. Thank you very much.